Hello, uh, it says live, so I'm hoping this time I've remembered to actually go on air when I start talking and you can hear what I say. Uh, I am joined today by a moth, uh, appositely, which I'm watching buzz sadly around the, the rug in, in front of me. So if at some point I, I leap suddenly sideways, uh, that's because I'm worried I'll set on the moth. Can you see a slight trembling effect to the, um, uh, the picture? That's because um, I've perched my webcam on there and zoomed it in, so you can actually see what's on the whiteboard. Uh, so you, uh, so sorry about that, it. it's not going to be done. Uh, and if you see this, this white patch, don't worry, I have not cut open my back and put a fetus in the incision. Uh, I just strained my neck, it's got a cold patch on. And uh, Lottie's over there on the sofa, uh, offering snark and commentary. If I'm lucky, a cup of tea. Uh, but right now, so this, is, this is water, uh, not gin, in the departure tradition, it's only 4 p.m. over here. Okay, I've got three questions before I start that I'll dispose of. Um, La Rosa asked uh, whether I tend to write text all in one go, or whether I tend to come back to it. I tend to write it all in one go uh, for three reasons. Uh, firstly, the way I tend to work is to sketch out the... Uh, the content with placeholder text, with really explicitly placeholder text. So if you say like, oh no, dead, 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 uh, or there's the infamous fnor, which I use as a marker that something hasn't been finished yet. Uh, so I'll do all the system work first, and then I'll come back um, and engage a different bit of my brain and write the actual content. So there's back and forth, and, and the one informs the other, obviously. If I realize there's a problem with the um, mechanics, I might change that while writing the text. If I have a particularly felicitous idea, or so I think, for a bit of text, I might write it while I'm doing the mechanics. But I tend to sit down in a concentrated burst of text. Secondly, often writing text, because of the kind of, of content it is, often there'll be like seven or eight or 20 or 30 different similar bits of text side by side. So there'll be like three winter uh, things, and there'll be like low, medium, and high. Uh, so I'll end up with 21, 24. Uh, different bits of text, one for each aspect, one for each level. And often it's very useful to be able to see what the different similar versions are, to copy and paste bits of them around, that's almost always goes wrong. Uh, and to break the pattern deliberately, so, you know, moth will usually be some sort of uh, gnomic nonsense, and winter will often be short. And it's much easier to see how to change the pattern virtuously when I've got things side by side. And thirdly, one of the many, many reasons I do better at minimalist text than at uh, long-form text or linear text is, is that I've never been very good at drafting and going away and coming back. I do do multiple drafts because I'm not a fucking genius and I can't get the thing right first time, but I will tend to do three or four drafts as I sit there and, and, and wrestle with it into shape. I think I would probably be a better writer if I'm better at going away and then coming back to it. Uh, but my attention is quite moth-like, so I, I tend not come back to something once I've done it very often. There, there are exceptions, and I will often do a, a, a read-through and make sure it's sensible. In fact, it occurs to me, one of the things I nearly always do is see how the text actually looks in the game separately from writing it. So that often means I get a second view, because one of the big tips I give if you're interested in writing game content, making your own game that's text heavy, is always make sure that you actually view whatever the text is in uh, the game itself rather than just a notepad. Because if something as trivial as a character turn going in the wrong place, changing the sense of it can really mess you up. Uh, the second question um, was um, uh, quite an energetic plea uh, to uh, make. Uh, sending out cultists and expeditions a bit less heartbreaking if it goes wrong. And one of the things I'm going to talk about briefly today is adding a roots mechanic to cultists so they don't always die necessarily. So that's that. The third thing, I'll just refresh my memory. Oh, yeah, literature. Somebody asked if I do, um, have you read any literature that, that informs specifically the romantic stuff in the game? The answer is not really. If you want to look at literature generally, that's informed cultists. I did a shorter um, stream on it uh, a few months back. It's still on the list of historic streams. I've uh, just reread John Master's uh, The Deceivers, uh, which is a very lively 
uh, novel written by an ex uh, British Indian Army officer uh, about the uh, Tung cult in uh, the 1820s, uh, which isn't exactly the kind of cult that says in the cult, but has some, some similarities. And, um, and that has some, some unusual romantic elements that I didn't expect. So I guess that's probably influencing there. But romance in games, especially system driven narrative games, works quite differently in all the important ways from um, romance in plots. And that's one of the challenges I want to talk about today. Actually, so that's a good route in. To quick look at the chat, let's keep going back and forth okay. like this. What's that? Oh, thank you. Well, yeah, yeah, if anybody says anything, I should be. Exactly. I just think about telekinesis. No, no, I'm probably back in the name at all. No. Uh, <laughs> I'm somebody's assuming that, that it actually it's, it's me doing about telekinesis. Mm -hmm. I mean, it might be, I might be throwing my voice as well. I may also have impersonated you. Like, to be your impersonation. I'm like to be a puppet. <laughs> Uh, let's see the presentation. Um, quite, quite something intelligent. Quite, quite candles. You're much posher than I am. <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> terribly accurate. Twenty more questions at the end, or as they come up? Uh, if something's relevant, and I'm, I'm in the middle of it, then, then okay. we'll interrupt me. But mostly at the end. And remind me if I drift down and count as well. What have we got? Oh, here, by the way, is the Theresa's build, Chris's build, Franklin's build. Um, uh, Broadly speaking, plans, these are just the same things that are on the blog. You may notice there is some orange text down the bottom as well. Uh, I tend to track framework changes slightly differently from content changes. Uh, so the, uh, uh, I, I need to sort out the DLC framework before I can actually press the DLC line. So that's an orange. Um, Pre-text entry on there, uh, I like the idea of people writing books and being able to name them. Um, crossover saves, one of the things that might make it in, but this is emphatically not a promise, uh, what people are recording to take it out of context, is the ability just to, to do a, a microsave of um, game content and import it into somebody else's game. So you can just send, send somebody a text file uh, with books you've written and Cultists you've recruited and also renamed, so that will then show up potentially in their uh, in their game. A really primitive way of sharing content around, literally sending text files around the internet. This is a low budget project, but that may not make it in. It may just be too much hassle at the time. We'll see how we go. Uh, ignore that. That should be on there. Uh, legacy flaws. Uh, I wanted the idea of, of, of having some of the legacies uh, have specific disadvantages or worse disadvantages, um, and I. Uh, uh, I just put that there to remind myself. Um, blue post it notes um, are ideas for content, past NPC and doorway of place, nuclear physics crossover. Green post it notes um, are uh, uh, mechanic ideas, and pink post it notes are sort of high level mechanic ideas. But here's the, the, the what I tend to do is, is go back and forth between my machine. Which is over where you are, if that makes any sense, uh, and the whiteboard, because it's very useful when you're you're working on a kind of system-driven but also creative project to be able to swap points of view. The way I talked about it earlier, when I was talking about writing, you have the sort of more contenty mechanical writing, and the more uh, prose-focused uh, creative writing. So. It's hard to be in both those places at the same time. So I literally go back and forth from my um, from my desk to the board as I think about system and I think about, about content and flavour. But also, the single most useful piece of advice that I have ever been given or given about coding, about writing, about any kind of problem solving, is that if you are really stuck, if you, you can't get a to writer's blog, if you, you, you run out of ideas, if you cannot fix that fucking bug, get up and go for a wee, or go for a cigarette if you do one of those, one of those things, or go to the shop. Anything that actually breaks your, 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 your loop, anything that makes you look at anything different. The number of times I have literally gone to the toilet and found that I had a really amazing idea on the way back from the toilet. I mean, really amazing by the standards of all the shit ideas I've been having up, up until that point. is unbelievable. Take a break, especially debugging. 
Uh, you, you can bang your head against a bug for an hour and not understand where you're going and, and be sure you're minutes away from fixing it. Get up, leave the room, do something else for two minutes, come back, or pop it in place. So that is one of the nice things about going back and forth with the keyboard and the whiteboard, is it does mean I'm constantly in a slightly different place, thank you, as long as I'm doing that. Right, specifics, wounds. Um, uh, nursing, I've written nursing on there. So wounds. Some of you may have noticed there was a, a new feature in the framework, not long before launch, where cards can acquire aspects during play uh, or have aspects moved during play. Those, those are internally in the framework referred to as mutations. And uh, they make a lot of stuff possible that wasn't possible earlier in the design. If I had another year to work on the game, uh, then it probably launched uh, uh, with them, but that is the same of the way. So one of the things I want to do, that I'd like to do with the additional information of Cultists, is give Cultists simple status effects. The simplest and most relevant is just um, that if they are a casualty or an expedition when they're doing cult business, they may end up being wounded rather than killed. And that means they get dropped out, they, they, they get fired out of the, um, of the recipe. You can't um, uh, use them uh, until they're healed. And a uh, couple of things there, I said they may, I haven't decided yet that the cultists always, sometimes, or occasionally get wounded instead of dying. If they always get wounded, that suddenly makes things much easier. If they only sometimes get wounded instead of dying, then this just tunes the difficulty knob uh, a little bit. Uh, and it may still mean that people who had a bad streak of luck and happen to get a 70% failure, followed by a 30% they haven't been wounded uh, 10 times in a row. Uh, that's really a pleasant experience. So there the, are the ways to address that, but they're out of scope for now. Uh, it may be always, it may be sometimes, it may be never. Um, I'll see how the balance works, so I've done some more work on it. Uh, another thing I said uh, is, is that they heal. Uh, I'll come back to that in a moment, because one other thing is just, at the moment my thinking is that cultists get wounded potentially three times, and every time they get healed, they get a scar. And if they take a, uh, another wound when they've got already two or maybe three scars, then they're the game for good. So if somebody has really been through the wars, then you probably don't want to send them back into the firing line again, unless you run out of better options. Nursing. So if you've got a wound in a game, there's basically two ways of, of fixing it from a player interaction point of view. One, if you just leave them unused, they heal. Two, if you do something for them or to them, they heal. Initially, I was thinking that I would add a feature to mutations where you had a sort of mini countdown on mutations that worked like a decay timer on cards, so that cultists healed over time. But I decided not to do that for two reasons. Firstly, you're already watching a lot of timers in Cultist Simulator, and I didn't want, three reasons actually, uh, we already watched enough cultist timers in Cultist Simulator, and I'm trying quite hard to avoid any more timers uh, if I can avoid it. Secondly, there's all kinds of specific problems with that. Um, the uh, interface issue of people being able to see this running out, we're kind of constantly clicking on the small thing uh, to expand it. Uh, so the mechanical issues about what happens if something runs out in the middle. Generally, stuff around cars decay if some of the slightly shonky parts of the game. There's a couple of, of semi exploits under the deliberately left in where you could put things in slots and time the stops, um, or you could hold things in your mouse and the time the stops which I, I'm not completely happy with, but taking them out uh, was, was too punishing, so I, I, I left them in the last three or four months. So there's lots of issues with doing that, uh, and I decided against it, um, uh, uh, probably, uh, not definitely. I'm trying to avoid putting more time in, I'm trying to avoid any more complexity in the framework. The third thing uh, is that um, whenever you're adding a feature to a system, ideally, you want it to double up as other features. You want to kill a couple of birds with one stone, and you want it to fill a gap that is missing in the system. If you keep on adding features, uh, you end up with something, just new features that have nothing to do with each other. You get something like the car in The Simpsons, but then they add everything that Homer tells them to add, uh, and, and it becomes a monster. Uh, one of the things that's missing in the game at the moment, because I didn't get enough time to do all the stuff I wanted to do before launch, is all those mysterious non-interactions with talk. 
there's lots of things where you can put a, a card as a subject in a talk interaction and it doesn't do anything useful. I wanted to be able to leave those for talking to cultists about stuff, but also for adding these sort of interactions. So the idea is that the way to heal the cultist is to talk to them and then that uh, um, and, and, and add some uh, relevant stuff, possibly just funds, uh, to, to heal them. Uh, that has a couple of other virtuous interactions I'll come back to. One more thing about rooms. Uh, with the sidebar, actually. So what, the thing about runes is that you, um, if you are on an expedition, if your cultists are on an expedition, you suffer a casualty. What the game does is say, remove one follower from the recipe. This means that uh, it, it will just, just pick a, a follower random, which might be a spirit or it might be a, a, some creature, or it might be a, a cultist. Um, and it means it doesn't tell you who the, uh, the follower is, uh, it will say there's been a casualty and you have to see who's been removed. I never really liked that. The expedition strain at the limit of what the framework can do already. And I didn't want to have special case code uh, that, that read for cultists that have just been removed and fed us out into the text. I've generally tried to avoid doing things that modify the text uh, in a situation uh, for specific if chaotic reasons that I'll talk about in another stream sometime. So one of the things that, uh, so that, that, was, that was a sort of known minor legal rule of expeditions anyway. Kills the cultists at the end, it's a bit brutal, they're just gone before you know what's happening. Uh, it doesn't even tell you who they are. So I've talked about adding wounds, thinking about adding wounds to cultists uh, if they, they suffer a casualty in an expedition. And if you add a wound to a cultist, they're still in the expedition, so their aspect will uh, continue to count towards fixing obstacles in the expedition, which isn't ideal. So then one thing you could do is, is write a bunch of code to say, let's not include a cultist that has a, uh, an aspect on them that counts as an aspect that should include them from this particular recipe, uh, which sounds awful and uh, fiddly. And another thing, which I, again I wanted to do for a bunch of purposes, is to fire the cultist out of the situation. So they've got cultists in the expedition, uh, Neville, inevitably Neville, gets wounded, uh, and I, I've got some code, I know some of you have been uh, data mining, so you've probably seen uh, some of the nascent code in there that does this, that would expel the cultist from the recipe, rather than just saying, um, uh, uh, remove a cultist, it will say, pick one cultist and expel them into another recipe, which will then apply the wound. So the effect from the player's point of view, if you didn't follow that, uh, is instead of saying there's a casualty, it'll say there's a casualty and you'll get a token coming out um, with Neville sitting in it looking miserable uh, and the token says this cultist has been uh, beaten up by the factory dead uh, or fallen off a log uh, or, or uh, eating yellow snow or whatever uh, and then when the time ticks down uh, they get the move applied, you've got Neville on their own. Importantly, not participating in the expedition and then you really try to put it back in the expedition you can't because the expedition no longer accepts followers you have the root status. Did anybody ask anything particularly? Um, Not about roots or uh, nursing. Right. Um, oh, so nursing uh, is, is, is the talking. Yeah. Uh, nursing is a talk interaction uh, where you bring um, uh, Carlos back to see the help. And I like the idea as well. You've got your little men's and little women's. You're actually doing something to bring back. I think one of the things about the game that works well is when people feel a personal connection uh, with their followers. Um, uh, whether it's the hint that keeps on uh, surviving or whether it's the, uh, the, the, the cultist uh, who, who miraculously murders Wakefield despite being only a, an edge form thing. And if you can actually do something uh, to look after them or improve them, uh, that's a, uh, probably quite a fun interaction. So here's a couple of things as a segue into actual romance, which I said I'd talk about. The first thing is why you can't send ingredients and tools on expeditions. It's something that I get a lot of the time in feedback. People say, can't you give, if you don't have any uh, cultists with uh, knock, uh, can't you put a frangiclave uh, in there to, uh, to allow them to get through stuff? So frangiclave is a knock aspect of tool, 
why can't group that in, even if they're not knock out spec and they can, can get through all the doors? There's two reasons why not. The first one is just balance. There's some deliberately really simple numbers involved in expeditions. And um, uh, it, it, it added a whole layer to try to make tools interact with that in a way that made sense with the sort of uh we never wanted. Um and it is the difficulty level on, on uh expeditions plateaus, uh, which is an issue I want to address here. Uh and and tools would make it worse. But also then you start thinking well could this could they use ingredients as well. Okay so what happens if you put an ingredient from an expedition? Does it get used up at the end? It probably does, doesn't it? Which feels a bit mean. I mean, expeditions already, they're a bit like potions in RPGs. You tend to not want to use them because you really need to, and I have some thoughts about that. Uh, but tools also, what happens if you give it to a cultist and the expedition fails anyway? Do you get the tool back? Do you lose it with the rest? It's a bit brutal. And when I did some very, very, very early playtesting, I immediately found myself reluctant uh, to use tools in that context. And finally, it just made the number of things you could put in the expedition um, that much more complicated. Instead of having a fun slot and a follower slot, uh, and uh, you, you also have a tool slot, and what happens if you run out of followers but you still got a tool in there? Does it, does it, you still need followers? What happens if you, you, um, uh, you, you lose your tool? Can you lose your tool? It's just a bunch of interaction that didn't really be able to mess with. None of these are insuperable problems. But expeditions are already really complex. And as I said, this screen at the edge of what the framework is meant to do. What it really needs is a sort of proper UI, right? Uh, with a bunch of stuff you can put in, different ways of interaction, actoring, and then you early. But the whole point of that cultist is that all the interactions are supposed to be basically the same one. Or I cheated a bit in some places. But what I like is the idea that you can give tools uh, in an upcoming build to cultists. So this is like to work in a couple of ways. Firstly, it's a permanent thing, because no way am I adding like a paper dollar slot to allow you to sort of equip different things on cultists. Oh. So if you, oh, says uh, So if you give uh, a cultist, um, um, uh, I want to say black tools, a noon stone, um, then they get a permanent bonus uh, to their lantern. Uh, and, and that's all she wrote, you don't get a noon stone back. Um, Secondly, you probably don't get the full bonus uh, of the tool. If you have a top end uh, tool, it probably gives the bonus of say five, the bottom end one, or a mid tier two. Because again, otherwise it just breaks all the numbers uh, wide open. I might get back in and, and fiddle with the numbers, but I, I'd rather avoid changing things from the game that's, that's launched. So this is my, my intonation. The reason I'm doing it now, which I'll come to in a moment, but it means that a bunch of the trash tools that you normally sell at the auction house because you, you've upgraded them um, have a bit of a, uh, a, a, an additional use now. I don't know for certain whether you would be able to give tools to people who don't have the relevant aspect, whether you can give a, a lantern tool like a Noonstone to a Grail cultist like Rhaenyra, uh, for example. Uh, there are reasons for and against. That. Not least of which is that people might assign them and they forget about them. Uh, and uh, aside from my mistake and, and, and find that it accidentally increases the game's lantern uh, stack, they've only got three seers, which is useless to them. Two seers, which is useless to them. Uh, tools. Uh, uh, yeah, so the, the reason that I can do this now is that I've added mutations of the game so cultists can get their, their steps increased. I also like the idea of buying ingredients to cultists, but again I need to think about how that would work. Is it as effective as giving them a tool? It seems a bit mean because tools are more powerful, but then again ingredients are more plentiful. Uh, another question is whether you could do it more than once. I think the answer is probably no, just for simple reasons of balance. So your decision is do I affix this tool to a follower, give them a bonus, or do I wait to see if the better tool comes up later? Um, another question is, is how the numbers actually work out because of the way the, the simple numbers of the game work. Going from five edge, eight edge is useful for rituals, but doesn't actually increase the chance of being able to do something. So maybe I've had some gradations in between. Um, if I add wounds to the game, 
And the chances are I will no longer have a 100% chance of success, which will be 90% uh, all down the line. So, so the, the bunch of a balance of questions. And the final thing is, is one of the things I really wanted to do is create rituals that allow you to bump up cultists' stats. And this is one of the reasons I put mutations in the first place, one of the reasons they put mutations. Uh, if I do that, that might be a bit redundant with tools, uh, but tools are simpler to add. So if I was going to add one of them, if it, sorry, tool assignment is simpler to add. So if I was going to add one of them, it'd be tool assignment. So that's probably something that's upcoming uh, as of today. And the reason it's upcoming as of today is, is a suggestion not even when we were talking design earlier, and I was talking about how to start a romance uh, with your characters, with your cultists. So initial design, you can only have romances with acquaintances and followers. I'd like to extend that to patrons. I'd like to extend that to um, uh, Hunters, uh, I'd, I'd like you potentially to be able to seduce hunters, or wax up and fall in love with hunters, or fail to seduce hunters and get locked up. And yes, I would like you to be able to um, romance some of the creatures, although the clamour of people demanding to marry is even, not to mention increasingly, if we fear for my soul and yours. Uh, about that. Yeah, I thought, I thought, I thought that might provoke a reaction. So I'd like to do that, but, but it depends how complex romance ends up for uh, acquaintances and followers, uh, balance and the rest of it. I did write the followers originally with about an eighth of an eye on a romance, which was in the original. Uh, I had had it in the launch, so they're better suited for it anyway. And, and, I mean, I don't even I don't know how you could have with a romantic with McCussigan, but I don't want people to offer suggestions. So. They've always been so dark, so Oh, for fuck's sake! <laughs> do you want to do your McCussigan voice? Yep. Okay. Uh, so, the, the, the most problematic phases um, of <laughs> the most problematic phases of, of, of uh, design for around the beginning and the end, that's not really true, the beginning and the middle, I guess, and the end. Fuck it. Okay. <laughs> One of the problems for romances was, was how you start them. So my first thought was just that you talk with the follower about passion, and that signals uh, that you are interested in pursuing a closer relationship with them. The problem is, so what this, this does that, that I like is it's straightforward. It's something the player can reasonably expect. You know, if you, if you talk with somebody about passion, then that immediately suggests a likely result of that interaction. It fills that gap I was talking about earlier. I talk with X about Y often doesn't do uh, anything in particular. So that was the, 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 the straightforward way of, of attaching a mutation to them that says an interest has been shown. There's some sort of initial frisson between, between you and the follower. What I don't like about that so much is the suggestion that your followers are a series of mannequins just standing there waiting uh, for you to, to say, I, I choose you. Uh, about the other. And, and this is generally an issue with, with romance in games. Uh, people talk about the vending machine model, uh, where you perform the correct interaction with the follower um, and love or sex pops out. The reason this is so prevalent, I mean, there's two reasons, I guess. One is just that, you know, a market for games where that's explicitly happening, dating simulations and things like this. And the other is that this is not just mechanically, but also in design terms, the way that games tend to work. Mechanically, it's difficult to put actual AI in a game. Let me rephrase that. It's difficult to put emotionally convincing um, AI in a game, just for, 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 for reasons of limited resource. The second reason is that if you could put emotionally convincing AI in a game, you probably wouldn't want to, because you don't want a game to be a simulator of the world. You don't want it to be as difficult to form a relationship with an NPC as it is with any random person in the world uh, who you might meet socially, because that is enormously complex and unpredictable. And people complain, justifiably, understandably, when you are told there is a, it is likely this action will fail, and then it fails, or when you're told it's likely this action will succeed, and it succeeds. 
A game like Celtis, which is all about managing resources and having a general vague idea of risk assessment, then suddenly introducing something as, as fragile and unpredictable and chaotic uh, as human psychology and sexuality uh, is a good way to confuse and frustrate people, even if I had the resources to do it, which I don't. So it's always going to be something much simpler. It's always going to be basically cars mechanics. And this is one of the things I meant by saying that, that romance and games often works very differently from romance and books. There's a whole bunch of design um, issues in games, especially at the more systemic end, uh, that uh, make it harder to manage romance the way it often has with a sort of boy meets girl, or boy meets boy, um, boy dates lover, boy breaks up with lover, they send some time apart, they gather it together. You know, this is the way 80% of war romances ever uh, work. And often games are the reason you can't do that. So I, I, I wanted it to be uh, um, fairly easy to understand how to start a romance with somebody. I also wanted it not to be so easy uh, to start a romance with somebody that was like picking uh, uh, your, your choice of tea off the supermarket shelf. Uh, you know, uh, Balciar is that saying Sushong. Uh, and uh, uh, Saliba, uh, it's probably Blue Boy or something. Uh, Lottie is silent and tutting over there. Never was English practice. Never was English practice. It's true. Uh, and so here are a couple of the other solutions I, I, I discussed in, uh, with Lottie and, and the reasons uh, we didn't go with it in the end. One was that NPCs would choose you uh, rather than them, you choosing them. So there'd probably be an event cycling on the board, um, which, or there'd be an extra season, uh, which said sometimes we'll pick somebody uh, and uh, that person will develop an interest in you, which you can then, then follow further or not. And I, uh, the reason I didn't like that in the end, one, it meant an extra timer. And I said earlier, I was trying to avoid those. I probably couldn't squeeze it into the time timer. An extra season would be tricky at this point. So it'd probably be an extra counter, next one, there might be romance counter, which is a lot of complexity and board space and mind share for, for one particular feature. Second reason is that ultimately this will just pick everyone, uh, unless it picks somebody, uh, and then sometimes they say, uh, no, I'm not interested. Um, and that's the problem, uh, or it rations it. So the problem with the first thing is, is that if you just get everyone interested in you a different order, then it's just like somebody putting the tea on the supermarket shelf over time. You still end up with everything for English breakfast to, to blue boys. Uh, if it's people sometimes decide they're not interested, that's an issue because how frustrating is it to set your cat at, it's probably going to be Rhaenyra, uh, but you know, people have a wide range, a range of tastes. Uh, and then just, just three hours of the game, you get picked up on the romance counter and it does a 70%, 30% check and it says, oh, no, we're near, which is you. You're only tempted to, re to reload, you're probably going to be tempted to reload then. So that's, that's unsatisfying. Uh, a, an, uh, and so I could just have rationed it, so I could just have said three people will be interested in you over the course of the game. But this takes us back to the Rhaenyra problem as well. If they're not one of those, just one person, two people, oh my God, met the third Neville, met the third Neville, it's not Neville. Uh, it's, it's Elbridge or something, uh, then again, that's, that's disappointing. So this is the problem about um, them coming to you, is in a nutshell, uh, they can turn you down. Uh, and the point about a game, especially when I come to simulate, which is largely responsive, and which exposes all its mechanics deliberately, is that that, that is even more than a job mechanic, which is deliberately tedious, that's putting theme ahead of player satisfaction. It's also bloody hard to debug. Anything that happens uh, when you have rely on random charts and things popping up at random times rather than in response to player action, it's just harder to develop because I, I, I can't, I have to keep um, putting preconditions in there that say trigger this now. Uh, so that, that, that's a, a factor as well when you're going to So So I threw that out and I went back to basically you interact with them um, in some way. Uh, and talk less passion uh, makes the most sense. But here's what I think it's likely to be. It's likely to be talk less passion with a basic anti-raising thing. So if you show an interest in a follower, then probably just using one passion, maybe two passion, is enough to uh, activate their interest in you. But it may be that they decide, I want an additional passion at 
this point. And it's an auction house mechanic. And maybe one after that, maybe one after that. So maybe if you don't have any passion and you get a really unlucky run, you're completely screwed because once they've decided they're not interested in you, they're never interested in you. Maybe there's a cutoff and it doesn't, um, uh, they never ask for more than four passion. Uh, maybe uh, the, uh, uh, you can awaken their interest in you somehow. Maybe they will sometimes be interested in reason. Uh, depending on who they are or where they show all this sort of stuff. But I'm strongly leaning because this thing keeps sprouting additional complexities just to say it's a passion anti raising thing. If you want to show an interest in somebody, you put passion in there. If you want more passion, more passion, okay, maybe they'll ask for three passion. If you don't have three passion knocking around, so you screw that one up. So you pick your time for the for, for shit. One of the other things that we uh, we talk uh, one of the other things that we talked about um, was uh, not in earlier was maybe you have to give them a little present. Maybe you have to give them a tool in order to show uh, to get them to show their uh, show interest in you. I love that. And I think that has a lot going for it, especially because it means that tools have an extra use, um, and uh, maybe you have to match the tool to the aspect. Uh, and you know, giving presents by the courtship is a thing. But also, where do ingredients come in? It's the kind of thing that people would ask, well, can I give them, um, you know, so you probably wouldn't want to give them, um, uh, like, uh, 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 wolf snow. Uh, I mean, yeah, but that's said very vile, it would probably quite go for wolf snow. But there's lots of things that are unpleasant enough ingredients you wouldn't want to give them. But if you want to give people, like, Gem dust, that's the most present. So, do you have ingredients as well? That'd be a reason that it wasn't. Or people would, would send me um, DMs on Twitter saying, Why can't I seduce never using um, uh, uh, Bazaar pigment or, or whatever? Uh, so, that's one minor reason. Another minor reason is that you can't see what somebody's aspect is from a sort of acquaintance. And I wanted people to be able to start the medicine from acquaintance level so that you can have a romance with somebody you never recruit. Some people might like rec prefer that, in fact. Um, and the third reason is it's a little bit like the vending machine dating simulator, or the cost simulator model. Uh, that you basically your potential magic partner standing there with their arms out, and you're just, just loading things onto them until they're like, like this, and they're like, yeah, okay, you know, let's get it on. So that that was, wasn't a model I was hugely attracted to, although fundamentally it's quite a transactional game, so maybe it would have had to be that way. But that's, that's, those are the reasons that, that we decided not to go with that. But but I don't feel, uh, okay, let's have, have a side. The, 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 the thing that came out of actually was if you give a tool to somebody as a gift, is it gone forever? Because that's a bit, a bit brutal, isn't it? You give the frantic to Neville and he's, he's your bae uh, if you put some more work in, but you've lost the frantic lake. So it should probably increase the stats, shouldn't it? In that case, yeah, I guess it should. In that case, there's another mechanic there which is worth thinking about. So probably what we're going with is, you can give tools to your followers, and there's a minority chance, probably around 30% range, that if you do that, they will develop a romantic interest in you, whether you want them to or not. And as soon as you get to, they will develop a romantic interest in you, whether you want them to or not, we're into a more interesting place. And this gets us out of the vending machine hole, uh, because somebody being romantically interested in you uh, when you're not interested in them, uh, is a, uh, an interesting dramatic situation built up with quite a sort of small number of parts. Stepping back a moment to people showing an interest in you, to you waiting for them to come to you, uh, rather than, um, uh, um, rather than you going to them. If all the people who you uh, who show an interest in you are not of interest to you or to your character, depending on whether you're, you're role playing, whether you're just having a, a personal reaction, then you might start to get a bit pissed off with the game. So notoriously, one of the things that enraged uh, a number of people playing Bioware games uh, was that they would get uh, most people playing Bioware games are still male because that's that's the video uh, game market, right? And a lot of men. Um, uh, don't necessarily enjoy the fictional experience being hit on by other men. So I, I don't give a fuck about that. Uh, I, 
uh, it is now the 21st century, I just look at my watch and check. Uh, and generally, if, if, if being gently, politely, uh, with the entire option of consent, uh, being hit on by uh, somebody of the same sex really bothers you, uh, then, then you probably need to go outside more. But, but, if you are interested in some of the characters that you find sexy compatible, if work, you know, you think uh, uh, Claudette's lovely, or Carol's lovely, uh, or you think Neville's lovely, and that Pepperidge is lovely, they're okay, getting the taste, and you keep on getting hit on by the wrong ones, that's going to be frustrating, it's going to be a slightly more emotional affair. Still more so um, when it's somebody like, like Violet. Now, you know, I'm, I'm 46, um, and I, I have limited sympathy with people who, um, uh, who get too negative about the idea of having uh, sex with older people um, for various reasons. But getting hit on my heart is a different experience from getting hit on my toe bag. Getting hit on my saliva is a different experience altogether. So uh, it, it is a, a, a game of mature themes. Uh, but I can see that with all the text, I spent a lot of effort making as unpleasant as possible about saliva and its semi coercive pudding habits. That players, especially, yeah, just as the lots of players might not be happy with somebody approaching them directly in that way. So that was another reason that I, I decided to stick with you going for the characters rather than them coming to you. Relatively low list of priorities, but it's 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 it's, it's a, a fiddly one. So this might still happen if you decide that uh, you know Saliba's Grail. Uh, you really need a, a grail person uh, uh, to get past uh, the long or the important mood, um, and you can't afford to. Uh, those numbers don't make any sense. But you give the Saliba a, a, a tool uh, to make you more effective than you cast them. Maybe Saliba's going to fixate on you anyway. But what that means is that's a risk. Maybe you need to be careful about showing too much favour to Saliba uh, because he's such an unpleasant individual. Uh, that might provoke a reaction that you're, you're not looking for. And again, we've got the virtuous effect of two uh, design elements overlapping with each other. You might, well, give somebody a tool in order to increase their ability to perform a task for you, and you might then find that means they show an interesting interest in you, which you might be in favour of, or might not be. Because of the jealousy mechanic especially, which I'll come back to in a moment. So somebody showed me interest in you. What does that actually mean? Uh, it, it means this is noted the stage at, at which somebody sort of considered changing a status on Facebook, but not actually changed it. Uh, they're available for the next step, which is probably a date and probably a unique or uniqueish date for everyone. First phase of design is what you do. In order to attract somebody's attention in the first place, or in order to extend their attention, you take them to the existence club. But some people, some cultists, this is time is a much better, the existence club is a much better time than other cultists. I can see uh, Rhaenyra uh, or Sylvia uh, or Clifton getting on with it. I can't see C uh, getting on in between these equations. So it made sense to be able to add a little bit of character to the um, uh, uh, to them. So, so, but, but there's only so many places in the game, right? So it may be that all the grail cultists want to go, and all the moth cultists want to go to the business club, uh, but all the lantern nerds want to go to um, uh, uh, Morlands, maybe even if it's closed because it's closed in their So So something better, but basically, you will um, get a hint about what kind of thing they would like to want to take the relationship to becoming an actual relationship. And it's up to you to work out on these, but it's probably not going to be that hard, much that hard, if you've actually read the text of the game, which I'm saying is great, but I bet they're not on the screen. Um, so you perform this unique action to them. Maybe, again, to the balance of bigness, you get an anti up effect where you have to take them to the distance club and then uh, extend passion. Uh, but, uh, uh, or, or maybe it, it, it's a constant uh, cost. And after that, they haven't just got the like, attractors to um, uh, mutator uh, aspect, they've got like, a courting uh, mutator aspect. And you two are a 
officially some sort of item. Now, I'm going to be apophenian about this, which means I'm going to leave a lot of gaps. So uh, that means, first of all, not being specific about whether you are being seen in public or dating or committed or walking out or showing those lovely 1920s phrases. Secondly, in many cases, since the vaguest stuff, you actually do a good deed. And uh, the next step is spend. Uh, next step is spending more quality time with them. And that probably means uh, talking with them again and putting a relevant stat in. So here is where we get to jealousy and personas. First of all, the benefits of spending time with somebody. You will probably get uh, an influence, which might always be grail or might not. You will probably get a unit of contentment. Uh, you might get a fleeting memory, uh, which I've got some more uses for in the next build. I'm considering making fleeting memories actually help with fascination. This is one of the things they did the, in an earlier version of the game to help pretend to what we were. And I took them out for balance reasons, but the dread fascination thing can be such a pain in the arse that it may well come back into it. Fleeting memories will have more of a use again. I do that. So these are things you might get out of it. Plus, you know, great writing. Uh, and the, uh, the delight of being able to tell people um, that, that you uh, read a few rounds of Valsian and, and lived to tell about it. But uh, also, if you spend quality time with somebody and somebody else in the world has developed an interest in you, that may not go too well. So what we get is, in, in mechanical terms, you, you, you do the spend quality time thing with somebody, and it then creates a greedy slot which looks for anybody else in the board who has the attractive to do If they get sucked in, they get, they've got a chance of getting jealous, and uh, they might suffer a status effect, they might leave your service, uh, they might go rebellious. Uh, I haven't decided exactly what negative effect would be in all circumstances, to what extent it will vary depending on the colors and the rest of it. It might not be a really generic thing, it might be super specific based on, on who they are and what they have and what they do. But this means you've got some interesting outcomes uh, the, the, uh, and some leading narrative confidence about the way they, they map out, I hope. So first of all, if you go all around uh, the board, trying to bag all your cultists, then at some point the wild oats you've sown are, in the immortal words of William Shakespeare, going to come home to roost. The English graduate of the corner wasn't listening, so I think I got away with, with, with that. Uh, fair enough. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, uh, while there's coming out of the roost. Okay. Right. Uh, so you need to be cautious. How many people you show interest in? Uh, because you may find that showing interest in too many people causes your cult to collapse into a mess of, of squabbling homicidal uh, uh, reports. Second thing is you might, for example, want to send, if you've shown an interest in, in Valsiar, you'd be not want to piss off Valsiar if you've shown an interest in Valsiar, uh, and then you want to spend some lovely time with Neville. Perhaps you should send Valsiar off on a long trip, <laughs> somewhere far away in the Wendy Mountains before you do that. So sneaky. But of course it never comes back early. Sorry, if she comes back early, she finds you sort of saying sweet things to Neville. That one, very, very awkward. So again, this, this ties into the persona of, of potentially quite an unpleasant cult leader uh, who, who manages um, uh, people's resources, but also into the narrative of somebody who is scrupulous about not um, displaying affection where it, it might, uh, uh, where they might have to make a commitment, and also being cautious about favouring somebody who might show an interest in you. Whether well, there's a way you can remove somebody's interest in you, whether it's developed in some way. But you've got a whole book, well, you've got a bunch of drama for you right now. You've got some, some fairly simple interactions. We, we, we've got player dates, Alcyon, and then Neville gets jealous. We've got player sends Neville uh, off to the evening hours, so he says, I'm with uh, We've got player uh, gives a uh, a uh, magic knife uh, to Victor, who then also gets, gets jealous. Uh, 
And then we've, we've got a bunch of potential, uh, minimally implemented keys to jettisons. So there's all that. Uh, when it comes to spending time with it, I think what we're talking about is, is, is probably a, a unique uh, uh, description for each cultist, because I wrote fucking 23 sex scenes for, for cultist simulator, um, for cultist simulator for summer C, so I could probably do 17 or many cult images for, for, for cultist simulator. Um, but I also want a little bit of boy meets girl, boy loses girl in this. So you've got complications. You've probably got about 30% chance every time you spend some lovely time with somebody of having a complication. Now again, lovely time doesn't necessarily mean sex. Uh, a couple of the uh, cultists uh, are written to be quite verified. And it makes sense to have an intense connection with somebody like that that's on an entirely non-physical platonic level. So a lot, some of this is, is writing carefully to be non-specific, some of it is writing to specific cultists. Complications, uh, generally if you want to spend time with, with somebody you need to put sat in, uh, which will get fatigued. And generally if you've got more platonically inclined cultists, you've got, you've got better than what reason put in, if you've got uh, the more uh, uh, passion inclined ones, the passion, and if it's veneer or saliva, it's probably going to be mostly physical, so you're going to end up fatiguing your health. But if you get a complication, the way this will usually manifest is another anti-raising thing. There is value, I eventually realised, in consistency across multiple mechanics, so if you get used to the idea that romance in this game in life is often about deciding how much commitment you're actually prepared to display and then sticking with it until something to go wrong. Uh, that's the end of that sentence. Uh, but yeah, I think if you get that the sense of that at the beginning, it continues all the way through, then players have an expectation which is likely to be satisfied. But complications, the idea is sometimes maybe if you don't provide enough help, then Saliba is no longer impressed with you and he will um, develop other mutations, which means other mutations in the in the game sense, which is a spare tentacle we might, but uh, other effects that might mean that he eventually loses interest in you, or leaves the game, or becomes a rebel. It's something I'll talk about in another stream or, or, or whatever. The whole rebellion rival thing is a, a, a different world of acts. But I don't want people to be able to feel they've solved Veneera or they've solved Saliba and they understand how best to optimize Veneera and Veneera and Saliba any more than I have to. There's got to be a strong element of that because, as I said earlier, we cannot allow romantic partners in a system driven game just to be cray cray because it is. It is uh, it, it may make a cheap, effective point uh, if you're feeling misogynist or misandrous, uh, but it's uh, dissatisfying for the player. But I want to use a little bit of uncertainty. I want to allow a um, uh, uh, some possibility for you not knowing which way a relationship's going to go. And that also opens the door to some relationships just being really fucked. So the idea is there's about seven different personae uh, which are associated with the seven individuals that have shown up in some of the recent um, uh, more obscure content actually, uh, but largely for aesthetic reasons. Seven personae which are things like constant or manipulative or um, doomed or melancholy uh, or uh, tempestuous. So these are not complicated AI personae that will give you lots of different lines depending on where you interact with them. These are uh, simple sets of mechanics that will mean that if you end up attached to somebody, if you end up dating somebody who is um, constant, they require more complications to go wrong uh, before they uh, before they, they give up on you. And they probably give up on you while you're about. And um, if uh, it's somebody who's um, uh, tempestuous, then when you get a complication, it does the anti-up thing, 
they might ask you for one of any of the stats, they're hard to predict. I've even considered saying they'll ask you for any of the stats, but you don't know um, uh, which one they actually want until you try to give it to them uh, and you get told you succeeded or failed. I've been in relationships that worked a little bit like that, uh, but I don't think it's, uh, it, you know, it, it doesn't pass the test of is it actually fun um, as against the theme. It might, there's some stuff in, in cultists that isn't actually fun, is there by design, but I think I'll probably be slightly more transparent than that. If you pick a character that's uh, vengeful, sorry, if you are dating a, a cultist that has actually been vengeful, um, then they, uh, and as soon as you wrong them, uh, that's probably it. If you are dating a cultist that is basically doomed, then the relationship will end up going south. No matter what you do, it's lost for the beginning. All you can do is stave off the, the point at which they finally go away and drown themselves out of despair. But the point is, each of the cultists might evince any one of two or three of these different persona and different occasions. Maybe Rhaenyra is going to be tempestuous. Maybe she's going to be vengeful. Maybe a bit of a surprise twist, she's going to be constant. Often these things are, um, uh, if you get somebody acting a little bit against time, that means a complex character or a gaudy character. Isabel, maybe Isabel is, is uh, she's probably not constant. She's probably never going to be constant, but it seems entirely possible that she'd be melancholy or demanding uh, or doomed. And you can probably think of different persona you would expect to see associated with each cultist, uh, if you read their, the descriptions at any point. And if you can, that means it's working. So what we get is, is again, overall in the narrative sense, hopefully we end up in a situation where you can start dating somebody, you think you know what they're like, and it might go terribly wrong, or it might be great. But again, it feels like something that a romance might actually be. And you have some control. If it starts going wrong, maybe you can fix it. Maybe you don't have the resources to fix it. Or maybe, very occasionally, you try to fix it, it goes wrong anyway, because some people uh, are just never going to be happy, or they're never going to be happy with you. So I think this provides a, a, a reasonable balance of the unpredictable, and the narratively interesting, and the individual future cultist, without being so unpredictable it's unplayable, without requiring me to write 50,000 words of, of extremely specific content for what happens um, if you upset Neville on a Tuesday afternoon because he asked for a crumpet and he really, can, he really wanted to crumpet and he bought him a crumpet. Just let you know there is actually an hour mark, so I might be able to ask questions. I am, I'm going to close after I talk about one last thing, very quickly. Uh, oh, by the way, this is the uh, section of the board. Uh, this is a section of the board that's on the interest in marking out for her, her artwork. So these are her contributions to the design discussion, my daughter. Uh, what's this? Unique effect from beloved as sacrifice in ascension, upgrade, or final rite. Taint of the blood, domestic bliss. So, uh, as Lottie said, we're upon an hour now, so I'll stop soon, but broadly speaking, I want to make somebody that you have romanced the hell out of, so you've upgraded them to the next level, a suitable um, uh, a candidate for using an ascension right or using it as a final right. And again, in role playing terms, this could be grotesque or tragic. It could be that you have um, groomed this individual uh, to be cannon fodder from the moment you met them. Or it could be that actually you are sacrificing your beloved for the greater good, as you, as you see it. Or it could flip and forth between the back and forth in the two. Or you could be not really role playing at all and regard the whole thing as an exercise in uh, statistics and probabilities. But I've worked quite hard uh, to, to minimise the degree to which people do that by adding text, I hope. Uh, I also like the idea of adding a domestic bliss option where maybe you start getting towards the point that you. Uh, could ascend, perhaps using your beloved as a, 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 a pawn in your vile game. And you can have something that operates rather like the Dubber and Glover modest victory ending, where you just decide to settle down with them because you've ended up becoming so fond with this person uh, 
uh, what does Robbie spend to the board? You can, you can do that. Or you just like to see what text is behind that ending, you know, that unlocks a really keen legacy to decide to do that. But as ever in CS, I like the opportunity. That I, what I like is suggesting to the player they're probably going to be a monster, but allowing a narrow arc of possibility for them to choose explicitly not to be a monster and do something else. I was considering today having a love question mark card that pops out of romantic interactions and allowing you to interact with that uh, with either reason or passion, much the same way we have to deal with the crest with reason or passion, decide that love is a thing to or love is slightly fundamental, um, and then to have that, to have some, some game effect later. So the game effect is where the design element that fell down, so that may not make that in, but that's, that's my thinking. I think it's all the things I wanted to say. Should I pass the question? Yeah. Okay, we want to back. Oh, I'm yes. going to exit the camera to get some more. Oh, oh, great. David Alexis, yes. Uh, he asks, are we going to romance followers only, or are summons, patrons, and detectives also options? So, Vavek, uh, I'm guessing, wasn't here at the beginning of this, the, the stream because I would like to add, in order of likelihood, um, patrons, detectives, and spirits. But they're not as scary as all this because the, 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 the balance requirements are different and I think there's a lot more content. So I'd like to, on balance, I think it probably won't make it in this time round. It might make it in down the, the line, it might be never. Um, I've got one from someone who of uh, with all the new things being added, new things to do with followers, will there be new action spots? No. Maybe. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no plans for me. Uh, the, I'm happy with the five we've got. I know there are choke points. I would rather deal with the choke points by adding different ways to achieve the effect you want using other less used verbs uh, than, um, than adding new verbs and new times to look at. There were a couple of additional actions in the very earliest prototype. There was an assign verb which you used to sort of talk to send people out on missions. And there was a renounce verb that you used basically as a beam to get rid of things you didn't want anymore. Neither of those made it into the game because their uses were so limited, it's been all time empty. Uh, it's not impossible they'll return. But like I said, I'd rather find constrictions um, and, and move the, the actions to other verbs so you can do similar things. You can find other ways to get contentment or other ways to get fun or whatever. Um, and um, and if, if all the verbs are, are uh, a full and the game's still too slow. Maybe I'll just add an extra fast forward button. But yeah. Um, what if you don't want to romance? Then you don't have to go for a romance. If uh, anyone on the board develops an interest in you, because, so if you, first of all, you could not talk to anybody with passion. So you, you do work for it, don't you? Really, that's fine. If you give a, um, uh, a tool to somebody, maybe that will provoke a romantic interest in you. Um, if you, uh, you know, what I'm thinking is like a 30% chance, maybe lower. Uh, if you nurse somebody back to health, that's something I forgot to say earlier, that's why nursing came in. Again, there's a chance they might develop a romantic interest in you. Uh, again, a, a, a lowish chance. Uh, and maybe actually this is something that can potentially trigger what's for uh, NPC, but I'll, I'll think about that. If it, if it could trigger it again and again, eventually everybody will, will be in love with you because we'll, we'll at some point nurse basically the other one. But I want it to be a, a, a limited child, not a, a, a triple child. So if you end up with five different people showing a romantic interest in people, if you're a cult leader, and I don't mean in the, in the sort of um, Waco compound sex cult sense, I mean if you are a charismatic figure uh, who has drawn people uh, as volunteers uh, to listen to what you're doing, it's very, very common to develop a, a romantic or studio romantic interest in, in, in you. This is, this is part of the uh, the narrative of, of, of the cult and the prophet, right? But you don't have to do anything with any of them. There's nothing that says you actually have to take anybody who's shown an interest in you on a date. And if you never take them on a date, then it's never going to progress past that point, and you're never going to end up with problems with jealousy. Which is always the shame. I like do. No, but but the, 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 I think I think sicking jealousy on people and deliberately eschewed actually uh, messing with the cult is probably been quite the um, is your relationship shadowed by the cult meaning, or is it something overarching human being? Good question. I, I've thought about um, 
uh, both approaches. Uh, I think I think a lot of this is going to be in the detail of the writing, and, and if I'm writing romance for Isabet uh, or Sylvia or the other Moffies, it's always going to be um, uh, you know more arcane because they just are. Um, and if it's somebody like Laidlaw, um, who's you know about making things and being cheerful, probably better than mundane. A lot of people are surprising, perhaps not a surprising number of people, ask me if there's going to be any sex magic in the game during the Kickstarter and after. And there isn't really, because a bunch of reasons, but um, uh, one of the, the biggest one of which is simply game balance, but uh, allowing an influence to emerge from spending quality time uh, with somebody you're romancing is, is, is a nod towards sex magic, basically, towards all the ideas that you get in all sorts of esoteric traditions um, of, of raising power uh, through carnal union. But I, I, don't, I don't know. I think in terms of, of design, it could be more mundane um, or more uh, rarefied. Uh, I think it'll, it'll probably be a blend of both. That's it. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, sorry? Yes, yeah, I think I think we should do it again. Thank you, Dottie, for agreeing uh, to this. I, I do tend, it's only part of your joke, to be the guy who accidentally announces new games uh, on Twitter without thinking about it on mobile board. So we do a mobile board? I mean, I get a look. Uh, there, uh, and, and, and um, but not in such a sort of design uh, stream is a good idea, and I hope I haven't given away too many things that might excite people at the DLC. Uh, uh, and, and, and yeah, we'd like to do all these again. Uh, so it did take an hour of my time uh, plus set up, so, so do. Let me know if it was uh, worth the hour plus of your time. Thank you very much.